the major broadcast networks and 24 regional networks and 20 key stations carried a news statement by Devon Woodland, president of the NFO. It was when Woodland called for an end to the grain embargo. Here's the news statement exactly the way NFO radio division fed it to the networks. National Farmers Organization President Devon Woodland today called for an end to the Soviet grain embargo as soon as the Olympic Games conclude. We hear information on both sides, but I'm convinced American grain is getting to the Soviet Union. Well, could Carter call off the boycott now? I don't think the president can rescind now the embargo. Uh, I think it would be an indication of weak leadership, and uh, there would be those that would suggest he's wish-washy. The possibility of ending the embargo, I think the ideal time would be that as the flag goes down on the Olympics. And if they do that, has the farmer solved his problem or has the government solved the farmer's problem at that point? I don't think we can ever uh, accept the fact that government will solve the problem. Woodland also said of ending the embargo after the Olympics that then it will be time to reestablish our trade relationship as a reputable and quality supplier with the Soviet Union. Phil Allen reporting from Corning, Iowa. Devon Woodland also did an interview at greater length for NFO's Coast to Coast Here's Info. He talks about the issues farmers and ranchers will have to deal with, regardless of foreign policy affecting agriculture. We've got to take and deal with the issue ourselves, and the facts are these. By the USDA's own figures, the American farmer this year is going to be producing grain for the market, uh, wheat, particularly, at $3.40 a bushel, approximately. That's going to cost him $5 a bushel. In other words, by their figures, which are hard, cold uh, facts on fertilizer and all costs involved, he's going to lose $1.60 a bushel on wheat out of his pocket. And similar figures suggest that he's going to also lose $0.73 cents a bushel on corn. And so it isn't uh, speculation anymore, it isn't maybe, it isn't farmers just complaining, but it is by statistics that are compiled by the Department of Agriculture that he will lose this amount of income. And he has to do something for himself through organization and never depend on the government because they've told us what we're going to lose and um, have very little sympathy for the fact and we have to use through collective bargaining the power of food or farm power. A dairy farmer near Milner, North Dakota, Monty Haugen, an NFO member, gives us a report about his experience with Lando Lakes, the big co-op he has been supplying. There's no NFO dairy program in his area. The government support price increase was announced in April to be effective in May, but according to Monty, the only one who saw the increase was the co-op not the farmers who supplied the milk. Here's Monty Haugen on the phone. They came out and said that we're supposed to get this increase, was it, 1st of April? About 85 cents or something like that, and we haven't got a penny out of it at all. Now, this increase was because of the increase in the support price? Right. Now, that's generally known and was mentioned in the news, wasn't it? And, our, and then it says in the paper we're supposed to make all this money, extra money, right. and the way it reads, the. Uh, Farmers are getting is twelve dollars and some cents for milk, and I just looked at my milk check. The last one I got is eleven seventy-four for grade A milk. Now that means that uh, this co-op yeah. wasn't passing along the increase to you, who supplied them, right? Right. So now, what is your response to all this? I still say if we can get in a phone here, that we can do a better job of getting more for our milk, and our tests would be where they belong. And they're just taking us every way you can think of. They just raised our trucking rates and just name it. They've got every angle they can work on and they get it on us. And you feel that part of the story is that they don't have any any competition in the area right. so they get by with whatever they want to. Right. If we'd have NFO in here, I know that we would, you know, we'd get a better price for our milk. If I, everybody else is supposed to be getting called out of some sense and I can't see it. Have you presented this fact to Land O'Lakes? Have you I said have to them? jumped them about it and they blame it onto the government. 
<laughs> That's where it all goes back, and it just irks me to no end. Yeah. Because I know NFO works because I ship all my cattle through NFO, all my grain goes through NFO. The only thing I can't get through NFO seems like is that milk. And the point you're making here is that when, when they get you a price through the NFO, you get the price. Right, and I'm, I've been real happy with NFO. I've been it for many years, and I've always made money with my cattle and on my grain and everything with them. But I can't make no money on my milk. That's because there's no NFO dairy program in your right. area now. Right. The special team of NFO dairy representatives who went into Vermont and the other New England states recently was only a dozen men. And yet they tripled the production going through NFO in that area. Here's Ted Strait, who was part of that team. We took a staff of professionally trained people out there and used a positive approach and attitude to explain the benefits of the new National Farmers Organization, such as being nationwide and in all commodities, guaranteed checks, a guaranteed market, and the ability to put a price tag on our product. And we could use that, couldn't we, Phil? We certainly could. Gary Ellis is head of NFO's feeder cattle division. Gary, why this feature on the back page of the NFO reporter urging fall delivery contracts right now? Phil, it is very important right now because in the northwestern area, cattle have to be moved by contract in order to have orderly marketing. When the first bad winter weather hits, many of these cattle are forced to move. The buyers realize this, and if these cattle are not contracted, the buyers will wait for the big runs and buy the cattle cheaper. There is also problems with facility, room, and ability to get transportation. When everyone is trying to sell at once, the temptation to sell quickly causes producers to drop their guard and sell to fly-by-night buyers, causing many bad checks and thousands of dollars lost by producers. Establishing a floor price, orderly marketing, and guaranteed checks are all benefits of the NFO feeder cattle contracting program but the program only works when the cattle are on contract, and right now that needs to be done. That was Gary Ellis of the Feeder Cattle Division. The San Luis Valley of Colorado is one of the most important sheep and lamb producing areas of the world. The National Farmers Organization made collective bargaining news there this very season in wool. Here's a report from on the scene by Jan Klecker, NFO Sheep Division Rep for the San Luis Valley. You'll hear some crosstalk on the phone. Uh, Jan is up in the mountains, and the phone connections are sent by relay up there. Jan, I understand that you have an interesting new contract in wool. Correct. We were finally able to get a wool contract with one of the largest wool marketing associations in the United States. It took a period of time due to the fact that the interest rate was involved in the price we were trying to negotiate. But after two and a half months, we're finally able to get a solid contract. And at how much is it sold for? The, the wool is sold for a dollar a pound. That's very good, isn't it? Yes, that is, considering the situation and the, the market price today. How long did you work on it, getting the block together? We spent probably three and a half months putting it together and about the same amount of time getting it sold. How many people were involved? Approximately 18 to 22 people, all good NFO members. Is this over quite a wide geographical area? Well, it's over the complete San Luis Valley and part of the southern part of the San Luis Valley. Well, that sounds like a very lively situation. I'm going to turn to Dick Hammond now. Is this typical of the sheep and lamb situation this year? Yes, it was a very difficult year when the interest rates shot up Why many of the buyers withdrew from the market. And uh, through the perseverance and the no, uh, volume of, of wool that we had in this block, uh, we were able to hold this buyer's interest and uh, to gain the price that we did. The sheep business basically is on the comeback. Uh, most buyers recognize that. Uh, in fact, uh, we've got one buyer in Missouri, uh, Packer that is, that is uh, wanting us to give him a working inventory so that he can increase his kill. Uh, as well as I have uh, one interest that is uh, would like us to see if we can find a uh, location for him to uh, open a, a plant in the Midwest here. Uh, however, this all hinges on our ability to be able to give him a inventory, have enough of an impact so that he would begin a feasibility study. And this has to be done basically through uh, collective bargaining, through the collective system that NFO has. That was Dick Hammond, director of the NFO Sheep and Lamb Division. 
one of the news headline personalities of the past generation is still a strong voice of the present. Dr. Leon Kaiserling, the economist, was interviewed by NFO's director of communications, Bill Wagner. It was on the occasion of Kaiserling's having a new book published. Bill Wagner and Kaiserling on the phone. Our guest today is Leon Kaiserling, who served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Harry S. Truman. Compared to today's chaotic economic times, the record of his years seems almost like a fairy tale. For instance, the interest rate was just under 4.5% on new homes in 1952. Farmers and ranchers, of course, recall those years as the parity years. Don't you estimate that uh, the American public in general has been overcharged two trillion, I say trillion dollars, since 1952 because of high interest rates? What high interest rates do very simply is provide more income to the lender at the expense of the borrower. Now, the total public and private debt does come to close to two trillion dollars. So these uh, high interest costs uh, serve no useful purpose. It's all a pattern of starving the lean and fattening the fat through a deliberate public policy of managing the money of the people. Maybe we should steal a page from OPEC's book and uh, at least try to begin to put a price on our products here uh, at the market gate like they're doing over there. Well, you don't have to steal from OPEC's book. You can just steal from the books of the uh, American corporations. They set their own prices, and actually they increase them faster when they're selling less because they want to reach their profit targets even with a lower volume. They increase their prices faster when, they, when, they, when the demand is low. Now, the problem of the farmer being able to, uh, to have something to say about his prices by joint action is eternal. I've been very much interested in it. I'd just like to get your general comments on the uh, grain embargo to the Soviet Union. I have said that if, and I, and I don't say that the grain embargo was right, but I have said that if it was a right and necessary action, then it is the responsibility of our government, which does it, to compensate fully with its own domestic policies with those who have otherwise been forced to bear the burden of the international policy. In other words, if the government finds that the grain embargo is desirable, if it does, then the farmer should not be made to bear the cost of that. It should be spread over the whole nation by the government using uh, its collected resources to bring the farmer to about the same position that he would be in if there were no grain embargo. Now, that's my position on it. There's absolutely no comparison between the ills uh, to the farmer due to the grain embargo and the ills to the farmer due to what's happened to interest rates. You see what I mean? That was Leon Kaiserling, Harry Truman's economic advisor. His new book, Money, Credit, and Interest, Their Gross Mismanagement by the Federal Reserve, sells for only $3. The research was funded by the Conference on Economic Progress, which Dr. Kaiserling heads. Here's the address to write for a book. 2610 Upton Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2008. I'll give the address again. Send your $3 direct to Washington. 2610 Upton Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2008. I'm Phil Allen for NFO News, and that for today is something to think about.